We've all heard the famous story of Bush looking in his eyes and seeing his soul in Slovenia when, he, when they first meet. But uh, during the first, the beginning uh, years, year or two of Putin's uh, presidency, what do you think he wants from America? I think the first uh, few years of Putin's presidency, he was on the one hand just trying to kind of put back together the state uh, at home in, in Russia, a state that he thought not incorrectly had largely uh, fallen apart uh, and lost its authority uh, in the 90s. And so he was most consumed with a kind of state gathering or state building project uh, at home. Uh, as concerns relations with the West, he was under no illusion about Russia's relative uh, power uh, to the United States at that moment. Of course, a much weaker, um, fragile or vulnerable power compared uh, to the United States. And he believed that there could be a way to if not enter into alliance exactly with uh, the United States, then at least to find areas of cooperation, common ground that might uh, have the cascading effect of, of building up uh, Russia's own power, of helping him with his state building project at home, uh, helping restore Russia's um, kind of uh, reach, influence, and presence on the international stage by attaching to essentially the world's largest um, superpower on some particular uh, projects or initiatives, and uh, he especially really believed in this narrative uh, that uh, took shape right after uh, the September 11th attacks of a kind of global uh, fight against terrorism, the Bush administration's global war on terrorism, and he really thought in the early days uh, of that uh, campaign and in the heightened interest uh, in Washington and around the world in, in fighting terrorism that Russia might uh, have a role uh, to play in that and, that, and that might be a way in uh, to uh, cooperation uh, with the United States, and, and the United States might actually uh, and genuinely be interested in, in Russia's uh, capacity and in, in Russia's uh, participation uh, in that fight. And in the way we hear the story, is, is, as people look back over the Yeltsin years, one of the things uh, that Putin would want is to uh, uh, rekindle respect in the world for Russia and, of course, for him, from uh, the United States, which had sort of had its way uh, the United States, the EU, the NATO had their way with Russia, mm -hmm. and he wanted, uh, I gather, uh, you know, a sort of place at the table. Uh, absolutely. I think, again, he was uh, under no uh, false illusions about Russia's relative power in, say, 2001 uh, to the United States, but he also thought uh, that with the Bush administration and, again, with this uh, interest in, in fighting terrorism, wherever it may occur around the globe, that that would give Russia a kind of seat at the table, a way to participate uh, as a kind of equal uh, with the United States uh, in, in various policy initiatives and, and operations around the world. Of course, what happens? <clears throat> the, the United States, does the United States warmly embrace uh, Vladimir Putin and Russia? I think what Putin didn't quite understand or anticipate is the degree to which he was intent on creating a kind of new relationship uh, with the United States, trying to enter into a kind of uh, partnership, at least on the terrorism front, with the United States, that Washington was sort of neither here nor there about that partnership, had very different uh, priorities, very different uh, objectives. Sure, they weren't opposed to working with Russia in certain areas, but it's not as if in 2001 and 2002, the main overarching strategic policy objective of the United States was improving relations with Russia. They were uh, very different objectives relating with, to terrorism, soon Iraq, uh, and Russia could or could not fit into those plans as uh, you know the demands of, of the day and the demands of the immediate tactical uh, objective required. But for Putin, uh, that again left him ultimately feeling uh, disrespected uh, on the outs, Russia's interests not really taken into consideration. The United States could work with Russia when it liked, but wasn't really committed to building a better relationship uh, with Russia, uh, happy to uh, disrespect, as it were, uh, Russia's interests, say, in Central Asia by putting uh, a heavy U.S. military uh, footprint there. All these things that made Putin very quickly feel like uh, from his perspective, as he, as he saw it, that whereas he was interested in um, uh, extending a hand uh, to Washington and to the Bush administration, that they would take it when it suited them, reject it when it didn't, and go on doing exactly uh, what they liked around the world, not really taking into account 
um, Russia's um, uh, Russia's own interests, Russia's uh, quote sphere of influence, uh, something that Putin uh, believed in and believes in in, in the former uh, Soviet states, and I think very quickly Putin soured on what he thought was uh, a kind of overture of friendship and cooperation to the United States that wasn't really fully accepted. Which brings us to the moment of the Munich speech in 2007, where he really, I, I, I guess. Uh, at least according to people like Victoria Newland and others that we talked to, they had head-snapping moments when he stands up there and says what he says. Uh, t tell me the story of what he's doing in Munich at that time. Uh, I, I think that the Munich speech is a, is a time where he is uh, very purposely and knowingly announcing uh, to the West that he is making a kind of historic break, uh, as it were, with trying to accommodate uh, Russia uh, to Western interests to try and uh, hold out hope that this kind of uh, alliance of sorts with the United States and the West more broadly uh, that had been discussed uh, starting in 2001 was still something that Russia was holding out hope for, aiming for. Um, I think this the, the fact that it was a head-snapping speech was, was by design. It was meant to be a very uh, abrupt and public and sharp breach with a period in which Russia was trying uh, to make itself essentially a kind of um, aspirational uh, partner uh, to Western states, that, it, that its ultimate goal was to find uh, areas of, of cooperation and common interest uh, with the West. And even if that wasn't working in the particular moment, even if there were difficulties on the day by day, by day that was still kind of what all parties assumed was the ultimate strategic uh, endpoint, what Putin ultimately wanted to get to, even if it wasn't uh, able to happen uh, on this particular day or that particular day. I think the Munich, Munich speech was an occasion where Putin announced to the world that that's no longer actually the strategic uh, endpoint. Something by then that was not necessarily a surprise. Uh, it was, you know, I think this the era of Russia trying to um, cooperate with or accommodate itself to American and Western interests had effectively ended long before that, but this was the kind of official announcement, as it were, of that period uh, coming to an end. So we've talked about him going in and, 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 uh, and, and what he wanted at the beginning with Bush, and we, we find ourselves in 2007 with him declaring that that's failed and that he's going another direction. Um, on, a, on a sort of personal level, gauge for me the, the arc of Vladimir Putin, the president, the person, uh, that puts him on that stage in 2007. I think that Putin's years uh, as president can be divided into kind of discrete uh, stages. Of course, they kind of bleed into one another, but nonetheless, we can talk about Putin at various phases uh, of his rule. And I think um, the the first phase, starting in 2000 with his ascendancy to the presidency, was about restoring the basic functioning and authority uh, of the Russian state. He saw a state that in the 90s had uh, lost its authority, in, in some cases lost its basic ability uh, to govern or at least administer the affairs of government, uh, as it were. And his first years in office were about gathering back um, authority and, and power for the central state apparatus, building what ultimately became known as the vertical of power, a system of government administration um, that uh, answered uh, to him uh, and, and to him alone all the way down to um, the local level, the smallest affairs of, of regional uh, politics. The second phase um, was about creating a de facto kind of agreement unspoken uh, with the Russian people in which they would give up certain political and civic freedoms in exchange for expanding uh, economic freedoms, as it were, coming in the form of um, increasing uh, GDP, higher wages, a sort of consumer wonderland blossoming in Moscow and other cities, uh, the likes of which the Russian people had never seen in all of their history. Uh, and for many years, that tacit agreement with the Russian people held. And on the, the uh, international arena during that time, Putin's agenda was to uh, restore a sense of historical justice uh, as he saw it, undo the wrongs that were visited upon Russia in a time of what Putin saw as uh, asymmetrical, ahistoric weakness. There was a period in the late 80s uh, during perestroika in the final years of the Soviet Union, the 90s after the Soviet collapse, when as Putin saw it, Russia was ahistorically weak, uh, weak in a way that was not uh, reflective of 
um, Russia's long kind of historical role uh, and historical birthright almost in, in geopolitics, and that the West, the United States in particular, took advantage of Russia in this ultimately short-lived period, as Putin saw it, of uh, weakness. And as Russia emerged from that period of weakness, thanks largely to the rise in global oil prices, which gave Putin um, uh, the economic uh, freedom to uh, uh, build his authority at home and to begin to project power uh, abroad, uh, he wanted to embark on a project of essentially undoing uh, those wrongs and restoring to Russia what he saw as its historic geopolitical birthright, as it will. And I think the Munich speech was also an announcement uh, of that project, uh, that Russia, having gotten back on its feet uh, economically, geopolitically, uh, militarily, with some of those oil profits being uh, funneled into a military modernization uh, program, that, that Russia was back, uh, as it were. Um, and um, the United States, countries in Europe, should be under no illusion or, or, or make no mistake about uh, Russia under Putin's intent to win back for itself uh, the position and stature that Putin sees as, as naturally um, uh, appropriate for Russia, given its, uh, its, its history, its size, and so on. One month later, uh, speaking of projection of military power or some form of projection of power, in Estonia, uh, the president gets up and turns on his computer, checks his bank balance, whatever it is, uh, you'll tell me the story. Uh, and suddenly there's a cyber attack. I guess nobody knows where it really comes from, but by now we know where it really comes from. Tell me the story of what happens in Estonia in a kind of narrative form, if mm -hmm. you can. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Estonia is an interesting case of, of how uh, history is still so alive uh, in this part of the world and in the minds of Russians uh, Putin especially, but but not only, because the story really begins with what sounds like a uh, simple, symbolic, but ultimately not that uh, meaningful decision about where to place uh, a statue. Uh, and the Estonian uh, government had decided to move a World War II statue, uh, a statue created by the Soviets after the war, commemorating the Soviet victory in the war, outside uh, of the city center. Uh, and that decision was taken by um, ethnic Russians, Russian speakers in Estonia, but more importantly by the Russian government back in Moscow as a great affront to historical memory, as a great affront to Russia, um, both uh, its, its past glories and its present, because of course in today's Russia um, the, the past is present and that the memory of Russia's um, victory in World War II, which came at, came at an enormous personal um, and, and human cost uh, is something that is very much alive in the imaginations of um, Russians today, officials and ordinary people. And so the decision to move this monument was taken as an uh, affront uh, to that memory and set in motion a quite uh, vitriolic and dramatic uh, Russian uh, response. I was here uh, at the time and I remember protests by youth activists very much organized by the Kremlin, but there was also something indeed genuine about them and that these Russian young people seemed to be really upset about this move of a statue. And there were protests for days in front of the Estonian embassy um, here in Moscow. And there were all sorts of diplomatic demarches being sent uh, back and forth, the Russian foreign ministry protesting, the Kremlin uh, protesting this move. And it all leads to this uh, cyber attack uh, in which you know much of Estonian um, kind of online and digital infrastructure is essentially rendered uh, inoperable. Uh, and, and in retrospect, uh, in hindsight, it seems to be one of the first cases where we can talk about Russia marshalling those sorts of um, cyber uh, resources uh, to further its, its geopolitical uh, interests. So it's a new weapon. What do you know? Uh, uh, now about what that what that was, mm -hmm. wh where it came from. I should say I know very little about the inner workings of Russia's cyber operations. No one really seems uh, to know exactly uh, the details of Russia's cyber capabilities, their their composition, uh, where exactly um, the hackers or or uh, people working on these cyber forces are. Are they attached to the defense ministry? Are they attached to the intelligence services? The answer seems to be. Uh, both, uh, they're, they're, they're everywhere, um, but to really judge exactly in, in what numbers and, and, and which 
kind of unit is doing which sorts of activities is something we don't really have a lot of information on. But one thing I've, I've heard from uh, Russian sources over and over again, uh, they've, they've implored me to remember that everything the Russians do, at least in the cyber realm and in other realms connected to um, defense and, and military uh, operations, uh, over the past 20 or so years have essentially been lifted from the American playbook that the Russians uh, have seen uh, what they, uh, the Russians have seen how the Americans wage um, modern warfare, uh, especially from a technological or organizational uh, perspective. And rather than reinvent the wheel, they just uh, bring those uh, frameworks, bring those kind of organizational and operational methods to Russia. Of course, it's worth saying they do this in a way uh, in accordance with how they think uh, American operations work. That's not the same thing to say as that's, uh, they're actually bringing uh, American know-how, uh, as it were, in the cyber realm to Russia. They're bringing what, uh, their interpretation, their understanding, their vision of how they've seen um, uh, American operations work uh, and incorporating them into their, uh, into their own. And I think uh, I'm going to go off on a yeah. tangent, if that's all right. Um, this question of Russians essentially copying what they think uh, or perceive to be American modus operandi is also important for understanding uh, the how and the why uh, the Kremlin might decide uh, to try and influence a foreign political environment all the way up to trying to uh, influence uh, an American political, um, uh, American presidential election. That's because as far as uh, the Kremlin sees it, that's exactly what uh, America has done all over the world, not just in the 25 years since the collapse of the Soviet Union, but, but going back all throughout um, the Cold War history as well, throughout the 20th century. And uh, it would be impossible uh, to convince a Kremlin official all the way up to Putin uh, that American intelligence services, um, American diplomatic corps, State Department, all the way up to the White House doesn't have an extensive track record of meddling in uh, foreign political processes and foreign elections, installing presidents, uh, and so on. And so uh, the Russian decision to try and get into the game, uh, as it were, of affecting uh, politics abroad, uh, you would never convince uh, a Kremlin official, and I'm convinced you'd never convince Putin himself, that they weren't doing uh, exactly uh, what the Americans have done, and in fact, taking or, or copying right out of uh, the American playbook. And I think that that's important understanding uh, not just uh, the motives to the Russian action, but also understanding it some operationally um, that um, uh, Russian officials involved in these kind of operations uh, don't think they're doing anything that original, but merely uh, doing what the Americans have, have long done and, and probably done better uh, than the Russians, uh, as they would argue. So the, the short take home from the Estonia action is? I, I think that Russia realized, perhaps smartly, correctly, uh, that it could get a lot of bang for the buck uh, with cyber uh, operations. I don't think that there was any appetite then, nor is there now, for entering into a direct uh, military confrontation with Estonia. It's a NATO uh, country. I think at the time, certainly, there was uh, more certainty about uh, uh, American and, and overall NATO commitments to Article 5 of collective uh, defense. And Putin understood that that was a losing game, entering into um, an overt uh, military confrontation or, 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 or intervening in Estonia in an undeniable uh, conventional military way was, was a non-starter uh, for the Kremlin. Um, and I think they realized, again, perhaps smartly, wisely, correctly, uh, that they could get a lot of mileage uh, out of a cyber incursion, a kind of asymmetric uh, means of warfare, and a, and a means of warfare that kept their fingerprints um, off the operation, as it were, especially back then when there was much less understanding about how these sorts of things uh, worked. Russia was able to achieve its objectives while avoiding uh, a uh, conflagration uh, and standoff with NATO itself, uh, with the United States. It was able to do it on the cheap and, and do it essentially um, successfully, I think, a lesson that uh, the Kremlin uh, took to heart. Early road test? Yeah, I don't think that um, necessarily Putin and those around him in the Kremlin in 2007 knew or, or could even imagine that one day they would, say, try and influence an American political election by hacking the servers of the Democratic National Committee and, and so on. I think that that wasn't even a pipe dream uh, at the time. And so it wasn't that this was 
necessarily a test for something bigger, but at the time, uh, it was a uh, attractive tactical tool for solving this particular uh, problem. Uh, and again, it worked. And I think the fact that it worked uh, retroactively turned it into a kind of um, road test uh, uh, and something that was bound to surface in, in Kremlin operations going forward. Uh, let's follow the trail of, uh, of the web, uh, cyber, disinformation, and, um, and add a new dimension, which is social media. Let's jump to 2011 and the protests forming in response to the, the apparently to the Duma elections and the, the, the elections. Uh, going all the way up to the the anger at the switch, the switch back uh, between Medvedev and, and Putin. Help me understand uh, what Putin knew and when he knew it about uh, the power of the West and the web uh, through those protests. Mm -hmm. I think there are some people in the Russian government, perhaps Medvedev, though by no means should we turn him into a kind of uh, Silicon Valley libertarian, but... Uh, there are some people in the Russian government who understand the way social media works and understand the way that that's able to amplify uh, or unite uh, genuine voices uh, across the political and, and social spectrum. But I don't think that's Putin, and I don't think that's um, the opinion of, of the other um, kind of security-minded uh, officials who have great influence who make up Putin's uh, inner circle uh, in, in the Kremlin. And I think for that, uh, cohort for that generation and for those um, men, and they're essentially all men with backgrounds uh, in the um, secret services and, and uh, uh, security forces, there's no such thing as genuine motivation. There's no such thing as pure, genuine uh, ideology. It's impossible. It, it just doesn't fit into their conception uh, of the world uh, that people uh, form and act based off of nothing more than um, true, genuine, internal, moral uh, conviction. The world is made up of interests, uh, as they see it, and forces uh, that try and uh, control and, and corral uh, those interests. So uh, the narrative in Putin's mind that seems to have emerged from the 2011 and 2012 protest was not that hundreds of thousands of his citizens uh, spontaneously and, and genuinely decided to, to go out into the streets to express their true uh, dissatisfaction uh, with his rule and the way that uh, Russia uh, was being governed uh, at the time, but there clearly, by definition, uh, must be some outside forces trying to um, stoke up uh, those feelings, uh, manipulate them. And I think that's why we see at the height of these protests, uh, Putin blaming personally uh, then Secretary of State uh, Hillary Clinton for activating the protest somehow, for giving the signal, as he said, uh, for the protesters uh, to go into the streets. That may have been uh, a cynical joke on Putin's part, uh, but I also think it reflected something very genuine, which is, again, as, as he saw it, um, uh, people don't just go out into the streets. People don't just express their personal civic political position just like that. They're, they're always being uh, directed, uh, manipulated, maybe even against their knowledge, but nonetheless, there are always higher outside forces at work. And when he learns, perceives uh, the power, I mean, somebody must tell him, uh, you know, they've, they've, yeah, you're right, and the West is using the web to pull people out of their homes get people lined up, you know, in the streets holding, you know, stop Putin mm -hmm. signs. A very interesting and revealing article appeared in 2013 in a rather obscure uh, military journal in Russian written by a man named Valery Gerasimov, uh, the top military official in Russia, akin to Russia's chair of Joint Chiefs uh, of Staff. Uh, and the article was written at the height of the wars and revolutions and protests uh, that came out of uh, the Arab Spring. And in this piece, Gerasimov talks about a kind of new form uh, of warfare, one that isn't based around conventional military uh, exchanges, but relies on the manipulation uh, of public opinion, the use of 
uh, information uh, dissemination, uh, the media, social movements, social media. Uh, and what's important uh, about this text, uh, there are a few things that are, that are interesting to understand about Gerasimo's article, but one is that he starts out by diagnosing the way that the West wages war. In other words, as he sees it, and I think that this is reflective of the opinion of Putin and others, the Arab Spring, for example, was essentially a case of the United States and other Western capitals uh, destabilizing regimes, stirring up protests, spreading and using uh, information uh, and, and the media uh, to create uh, discontent uh, and disorder. In the case of Libya, as Gerasimov uh, writes, uh, when, when all those methods don't work, then you can also, uh, as it were, send in uh, the fighter jets. And uh, Gerasimov is describing uh, in this article what he sees as how in the 21st century uh, the West achieves its geopolitical uh, objectives through a new kind of warfare, something that doesn't look at all like war as we're used to, but nonetheless has the same ultimate uh, effect. And the, the second uh, and, and no less important thing to understand about this article is that it's seen inside the Russia, uh, inside the Russian security and, and uh, defense and, and political establishment as a kind of call to arms. It, it diagnoses what the West is doing around the world. The implication is the West would like to do this to us as well, uh, to foment uh, discontent, uh, to weaken uh, the system and the regime uh, from within, to stir up uh, political passions and discontent. And therefore, we need to get in the game too. Uh, and although Gerasimov in the article doesn't explicitly say and let's create you know, similar capacity and similar forces in Russia, that's the ultimate uh, effect and the ultimate intent, I think, uh, of the piece was uh, to tell the political leadership of the country, say Putin uh, himself, that this is what uh, they are doing around the world. This is what they want to do to us. We better understand these methods and develop uh, the, the capacity to use them ourselves if we want to be geopolitically competitive in the 21st century. Any doubt in your mind that Putin uh, reads this, reacts to it, and says, I'll take that roadmap? I, I don't know if Putin um, uh, is a regular subscriber uh, to the military industrial courier or wherever uh, that this uh, article actually appeared, but I certainly think that Gerasimov is an extraordinarily influential figure with direct personal access uh, to Putin. Uh, was talking uh, about these issues, and the very fact that the text appeared uh, indicates that it was uh, something uh, under discussion in, 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 in uh, high-level political circles uh, here uh, in Moscow. A, a, an article like that doesn't just appear uh, accidentally or on a whim. It's uh, reflective uh, of a mood and a certain intent. And, and at exactly this moment, uh, he is, or for at least right around this time, we've had people tell us the story of Putin watching the murder of uh, Gaddafi uh, transfixed, almost as if he's looking into a crystal ball of his own future. There are a few, um, there are a few reasons to think that uh, the fall of Gaddafi and the uh, NATO-led air war in, Na in Libya were, uh, represented a kind of turning point um, for Putin. Um, you know, at the time he was not president, uh, that role was being formally filled uh, by Dmitry Medvedev, and very consequentially, uh, with Medvedev's direction, Russia abstained uh, from a vote in the UN Security Council that paved the way for this military operation uh, in Libya. And, and Putin, uh, as we understand, could never forgive uh, later Medvedev for this uh, mistake, as Putin saw it, and he also understood it as a mistake of his own in the fact that he had uh, taken his hands off the reins and that when he wasn't uh, monitoring and in charge of every decision, especially as concerns to uh, foreign policy and Russia's ge geopolitical uh, role, that things like uh, the fall of uh, Gaddafi uh, were, were inevitable, or at least uh, more likely, uh, when uh, Putin's eye uh, wasn't on the ball. Uh, and, and the fact that what started out um, as, as Putin and those in the Kremlin saw it, protests in Libya surely, inevitably, by definition, uh, stirred up and supported by uh, Western capitals, turned in uh, to a uh, chaotic uh, 
bloody, awful civil war in which the West then intervened directly militarily. All of that just fit perfectly with Putin's uh, developing uh, view of the world, a view of the world that he had come uh, to believe in after revolutions uh, in his uh, backyard in, in, in Georgia and in Ukraine uh, and elsewhere and looking uh, across the Middle East and across the world. Libya was the quintessence um, of what he saw uh, as this kind of amalgam uh, of, of forces the West brings to bear to uh, bring about regime change, essentially. And the fact that that regime change was capped off with this gruesome uh, and ugly murder uh, of Gaddafi being dragged out of essentially a sewer pipe uh, in Libya drove home to Putin um, how these things uh, really end, how these things really end for leaders who fall under the crosshairs uh, of the West. Uh, would he uh, be such a leader one day? I think all of this uh, reconfirmed his certainty um, that on the one hand, uh, the West led by the United States is out to uh, change political regimes it finds either unsavory or uh, undesirable, not useful in some way, and that as someone who stood up to Western interests time and again, he might uh, fall under those same crosshairs uh, himself one day. And all of that redoubled his commitment to make sure that that never happened, both by strengthening uh, his own uh, system and, and rule internally and also uh, uh, projecting power outward uh, to, to keep the West at bay uh, geopolitically across the globe wherever he could. So he's meeting regularly with, or often or sometimes with Gerasimov, hearing about the new toolkit, uh, and he's locked and loaded. Yeah, and I think that um, uh, one advantage uh, of a top-down, um, essentially authoritarian uh, system is that you can uh, do things quickly. Uh, once the uh, political decision, the political will uh, is there, you can really marshal um, resources across uh, the board to achieve an objective, and we saw that. Uh, very quickly uh, in Ukraine, uh, in Crimea, um, in the run-up uh, and during uh, the annexation, and also in eastern Ukraine in the Donbass region in the war that uh, broke out there shortly thereafter. Uh, when, you know, Russia, the nature of Russia's political system allows it to be a kind of mass mobilization uh, state, as it were, in that when it sets its targets on a uh, political objective, it can bring everything to bear from the information and propaganda resources uh, of uh, state television to the use of um, quite uh, impressive and now, as we've seen in Crimea and elsewhere, advanced special operations uh, forces, uh, cyber uh, capability. All of those resources can be uh, marshaled and brought to bear uh, quickly and in a way um, that, that are all working in kind of concert uh, with each other. And, and uh, Western states, the United States in particular, is, is at a kind of disadvantage there and that it, it can't, uh, with one phone call or one uh, closed door presidential uh, meeting, you know, bring together everything from uh, NBC to Central Command. Uh, those aren't necessarily uh, resources available to an American president, but they are uh, to a Russian president. And he did it. I mean, he literally did it. Take me with some specificity. We don't have to go all the way down to all the fine grain details. But tell me the story of the annexation of Crimea and, and maybe go back to uh, Maiden, maybe go back. But, but do whatever you want to do to, to, to set the stage for us to see him swing into action in mm -hmm. Crimea and Ukraine. Mm -hmm. You know, there's one interesting parallel between uh, Crimea uh, and the influence operation in the American political uh, election, and I think it's worth talking about for a minute. And that's something that someone inside the Russian defense and security establishment uh, told me uh, when I pushed uh, for some explanation about what Russia might have even theoretically done uh, in the United States in the run-up uh, to the election. And, and what he explained to me is that, look, we're not... Um, alchemists here. We're not able to turn uh, water into wine. We can't make something out of nothing. Um, but what influence uh, operations and, and, and covert operations can do is to take existing uh, sentiment, 
take existing social and political uh, factors and stoke them, manipulate them, uh, add a little bit on top uh, so that they reach some uh, critical uh, mass and create an outcome uh, that is desirable. And I think that that was the case uh, in Crimea and, and both potentially the case in the United States as well. And in Crimea, you had... So, so Crimea really is a road test for something that's coming in the future. Uh, in, in hindsight, yes. Uh, and in, in, in Crimea, you have um, a geographically um, defined territory. It's, it's a peninsula that exists uh, on its own, jutting out uh, into the Black Sea with a uh, disproportionately large Russian population, ethnically Russian, uh, Russian-speaking, people who have uh, historic cultural and even political uh, affection um, for Russia, many of whom feel themselves more Russian uh, than Ukrainian. Um, and, and that population was also uh, uh, concerned, uh, dismayed, frightened by the appearance of um, anti-government protests uh, in Kiev that had taken place that fall and winter. The Maidan movement, um, Crimea was not full of Maidan supporters. If anything, it was probably full of Maidan uh, skeptics. And in that environment, it didn't take a very big match uh, to, to light a fire. Um, Russia was able uh, to come in, uh, pump in uh, information and propaganda uh, programming on Russian state television, which everyone in Crimea watched, warning even more uh, of the danger of protest leaders uh, in uh, Kiev, calling them fascists, stoking this fear that uh, the next, the first thing after the success of the revolution is all of these um, anti-government revolutionaries from Kiev would come to Crimea uh, to somehow subjugate um, or, or exact revenge uh, on the Crimean population. And uh, those sorts of messages played right into the existing uh, fears and prejudices uh, of the Crimean population. Russia was able to quite effectively use the language issue. Uh, the majority of uh, Crimean uh, citizens, people living in Crimea, were Russian speakers um, with a fear that uh, that language, Russian language, might lose some official status in Ukraine after Maidan. Russia was all too happy to stoke that fear uh, through its uh, information, television, diplomatic uh, channels to make the Crimean population maximally afraid um, of uh, that outcome. And so in that environment, in the uh, chaos and uh, fear and disorder of the immediate post-Maidan period, the days after former Ukrainian president Viktor Yanukovych left and there was a power vacuum uh, in Kiev, Russia was quite skillfully able to step into that vacuum and to take uh, this latent or pre-existing um, uh, sympathy or, 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 or support for Russia and whip it up into uh, a referendum in which uh, the Crimean uh, population voted uh, to join uh, Russia, a referendum held in a period of maximum uh, disorder, maximum fear, uh, with Russian special forces essentially taking de facto uh, control uh, of, the peninsula, of the Crimean Peninsula. But it all worked out to be an operation that, uh, in Putin's eyes, was considered uh, a great success. Uh, all of this began in uh, late February, early March. And by the end of March, uh, Crimea was uh, a new federal republic uh, in, in the Russian Federation. I think that the speed and seamlessness which, which uh, Russia was able to pull off that operation uh, was uh, both incredibly pleasing to Putin and gave him confidence about how those methods used all in concert could be deployed elsewhere. Now, we talked about uh, the Munich speech in 2007. Here we are now in 2014, seven years later. He gives another speech, uh, March 18th, I think, uh, about Crimea and really another chapter of, of uh, uh, the evolution of uh, Vladimir Putin as president, warrior, international force. Mm -hmm. uh, help me, uh, before we talk specifically about the speech, let's go back once more. You said there are many phases of Putin that one needs to keep track of. Mm -hmm. Let's add this, I suppose, as another phase. Absolutely. Um, the, the third phase, uh, the phase that I think we're currently still in, uh, which began with Putin's return to the presidency in 2012, but really uh, took shape 
in 2014 with the events in Ukraine, uh, the annexation of Crimea and the war in Donbass, and, and the standoff uh, with the West that all of those events uh, created, uh, was Putin uh, delivering both for himself and for the Russian people a measure of uh, historical revenge uh, to once and for all uh, bring Russia back to the table, uh, the geopolitical table, on its own terms, no longer trying to accommodate itself to the interests of the United States and the West, uh, to pursue only its own interests and really overturn uh, decades uh, of, of disrespect uh, to have um, Russia uh, rejoin the, the Club of Nations, not uh, as kind of Washington or Brussels saw appropriate, but as Russia uh, saw appropriate in accordance with its historical mission, its historical birthright, things uh, defined by Putin and, and tapping in uh, to the Russian uh, psyche, which after the collapse of the Soviet Union, I think you could say collectively suffered from uh, in, a, in a sense of imperial longing, imperial hangover, the disorientation at the loss of superpower status uh, and empire. And Putin very skillfully was able to play into those pathologies, and especially with the annexation of Crimea, and even with the standoff with the West. In a sense, uh, worsening relations with the West were a kind of proof uh, that Russia was on the just and correct historical course that, by definition, uh, a standoff with the West meant that Russia was uh, pursuing its own eternal uh, interests, uh, and that the, the more Putin found himself in conflict with the West, the more that was a demonstration uh, that Russia was again a uh, proud and independent uh, superpower. There's a, there's a component to all of this which we should address, which is the United States' role in Ukraine itself, the, the, the active State Department presence in somebody like Toria Newland, for example, the the wiretapping, the phone call from her to the American ambassador in Kiev, and and the weaponizing of that phone call as an historic moment, of uh, of uh, finally we're going to use information we gather surreptitiously, uh, as a weapon. That feels like a, a central moment in the cyber war mm -hmm. story, uh, which has been a sub theme. Mm -hmm. here. I think from the Kremlin uh, perception, uh, the Maidan protests in Ukraine were really uh, not so much about the concerns of Ukrainian citizens who came out to Maidan to protest, but really that was an information war waged between Moscow and the West. And I think that that's potentially lost uh, in, in the American understanding uh, of those protests, and I don't think at least was, was fully understood at the time that um, what to uh, State Department and, and White House officials might have seemed like um, this uh, genuine uh, manifestation of uh, popular discontent on the streets of Kiev in Moscow was seen uh, less about Ukraine itself and more about Ukraine as a kind of uh, platform or canvas uh, setting for uh, a standoff between uh, the West and Russia, yet another standoff and a whole series of geopolitical standoffs. And this one in particular was really an information war. It was an information campaign. That was um, the ammo uh, in, in this battle. And, and both sides, as the Kremlin understood it, were wielding um, information and the spread of information, the control of information to pursue uh, their objectives. And so the decision, for example, by the Kremlin to publish this surreptitiously recorded phone call between uh, Victoria Newland, State Department official, and the U.S. ambassador um, to uh, Ukraine, I don't think the Kremlin saw that as a kind of great breach, as if the Kremlin was entering into some new phase of international relations, new phase of information warfare. I think, uh, as the Kremlin understood it, Maidan was a kind of no-holds-barred information war between uh, the United States uh, and Russia. And so the publishing of this phone call was just another salvo in it what uh, had become, again, in, in Putin's eyes, a kind of dirty war uh, of information in which uh, there, there were no holds uh, barred uh, in the way that Washington and, and Moscow would try and compete for geopolitical 
influence in Ukraine, again, using uh, information and the way that information can be used to stir up uh, crowds and, and inflame political passions uh, in the street. Why, so why the big deal? Why was it made such a big deal, certainly by the U.S. side? I think in Washington, the Maidan protests were seen uh, as the result of very real and, and, and genuine uh, political sentiment uh, led first and foremost by the Ukrainian people who came out in huge numbers to protest um, the corruption and um, authoritarian uh, leanings of the Yanukovych government. I don't think uh, the Kremlin took the, the, that perception of Maidan seriously at all. I think from the very beginning they saw it as a U.S. and, and Western-led uh, and, and sponsored operation to overthrow uh, the Yanukovych administration, which uh, the West didn't like and, and uh, saw less convenient uh, and less palatable as some uh, more pro-Western uh, alternative. And so uh, the publishing, the release of that uh, Newland Pyatt uh, phone call kind of offended Washington's virgin sensibilities who thought that what Maidan was, was, you know, uh, the West is supporting the genuine democratic aspirations of these thousands of people in the central square of Kiev, where to Russia, since Maidan was this kind of dirty information war between um, Russia and the West, why was this uh, phone call, publishing this phone call, any different than as in the Russian perception, all of these other uh, dirty tricks um, and, and uh, attempts uh, to manipulate and stoke uh, public opinion uh, that the West was doing. I think um, going back to, say, the Gerasimov text as a kind of um, instructional guide as to how Russia views these things, there are very few moments where I think a Russian official, Putin himself, would genuinely think, we have done something particularly novel or transgressive here. We've changed the rules uh, of how relations between our two countries work. I think in just about every case, the Russian argument would be, we're just doing uh, exactly what you've done all these years. It's not our fault if you don't like the taste of your own medicine. Mm. And uh, just as long as we're along, uh, along this road, the little green men, what's up with that? Uh, the little green men, was a uh, funny neologism uh, for the unacknowledged uh, Russian special forces who suddenly emerged um, uh, in Crimea uh, right after uh, the Maidan protests and in the days before uh, the annexation. I remember arriving um, uh, to Crimea just a few days after the Maidan protests ended in a, still a period of great uncertainty. This was before anyone really uh, understood exactly what Russia was up to, and no one then was talking about uh, annexation. But nonetheless, the airport where I landed was surrounded by some men uh, in green fatigues uh, with um, uh, machine guns. They looked very uh, well equipped. They looked like a professional fighting force. These were not a, this was not a ragtag band of local vigilantes, but they wore no insignia. They didn't identify themselves. Um, they tried not to attract. Uh, too much attention, though it's hard not to attract attention when you're uh, standing uh, with a machine gun outside uh, of an airport. Um, but that was, though they were the little green men. They were um, the, in hindsight, what we know as Russian uh, special forces, um, many of whom already based in Crimea because of Russia's longstanding uh, and pre-existing military agreements with uh, Ukraine, but who came out of their bases to essentially pave the way uh, for the referendum, paved the way for annexation uh, to take over uh, Ukrainian military bases uh, in, in Crimea, fanning out all over uh, the peninsula and, and essentially creating a kind of fait accompli for Russia before the rest of the world uh, understood what was going on, before the very chaotic, very weak post-revolutionary government in Kiev could come up with any sort of uh, plan, um, before anyone uh, could really react and come up with a counter uh, counter strategy, a reaction, uh, Russia had essentially already taken over uh, Crimea with the help of these little green men. In, in, in the aftermath, the immediate aftermath, Putin lies. Yeah? Uh, yes, Putin, uh, uh, Putin repeatedly laughed off uh, the notion that there were 
Russian soldiers uh, in Crimea. Uh, the Russian state media amplified uh, that message, calling Western uh, governments, Western journalists, I suppose by extension myself, a bunch of uh, paranoid hysterics who were seeing ghosts and uh, inventing things and um, um, reporting not at all the facts, which were that in the Russian narrative, uh, this was just a local uprising uh, of uh, Crimeans who concerned about the um, new government in, in Kiev, all of which, of course, at the time was laughingly false. No one was under any illusions about who these little green men were. But even with time, uh, Putin himself admitted it, uh, kind of laughingly in aside a year or a year or two uh, later that, oh yeah, of course, actually those were uh, Russian uh, special forces. And oh yeah, we did have uh, troops uh, on the ground. And, and it was as if he, uh, statement from a year ago meant nothing about a statement today. And, and truth itself was kind of um, malleable, or at least nothing more than yet another instrument in this uh, uh, larger kind of macro uh, strategic uh, standoff with the West, that information was a weapon, and so it can be used uh, just like all other weapons um, to uh, achieve kind of maximum effect uh, for your own side and to uh, inflict kind of confusion or so weakness uh, on the opposing side. There's a, there's a, a dispute in pretty good one in Washington about the lethal arms for the Ukrainians. What was the effect in, in Moscow as it watches Washington and the President of the United mm -hmm. States try to make a decision about mm -hmm. what to do about this? Yeah, I spent a good part of the summer of 2014 in eastern Ukraine, in and around the battlefields uh, in the Donbass on, on both sides, on the side of uh, the Ukrainian army and on the side of the separatist rebels uh, very much supported and backed um, by Moscow. And I think it was clear that that war was always going to mean much more to Moscow than it meant to Washington. Uh, it was in Russia's backyard. Uh, there were Russian soldiers on the ground there. Uh, as a kind of strategic objective, the outcome of that war and the ultimate composition uh, of a kind of post-war uh, settlement and, 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 and exactly what form would those rebel territories take in Ukraine, all of those questions were kind of existential uh, to the Kremlin in a way that they weren't really, uh, when it comes down to it, it seems, uh, first order um, uh, strategic uh, questions or priorities uh, for Washington. And so I think what that meant, and you could see it in the dynamic uh, of the war uh, on the ground, is that under no circumstances would the Kremlin let uh, the rebels whom it was backing lose. Uh, and, and there was no outcome one could imagine in which um, Putin would allow for a kind of battlefield or military defeat uh, of the rebel force that Russia was backing, therefore kind of depriving Russia of this instrument or wedge by which it could uh, manipulate Ukrainian politics and therefore achieve its own uh, geopolitical objectives uh, in its own backyard. And I think uh, as regards the weapons question, I didn't at the time, nor do I now have a uh, kind of personal uh, policy uh, view on the question or uh, think they should, the Obama administration should or should not have given weapons. But I think what's clear is that uh, however far uh, the Ukrainian military escalated, say, with the help of uh, new advanced um, uh, Western American weaponry, uh, the Russian, uh, the Kremlin would not have backed down uh, from that war. I don't think it would have allowed uh, the, the rebel forces uh, whom it was supplying, backing, and at times assisting with direct military intervention to lose on the battlefield. I don't think they would have uh, walked away from that fight. It was too important, too strategically uh, central and significant to Putin. A question of prestige on the world stage, prestige at home, but also what happens in Ukraine is simply more important to Putin uh, <coughs> than it is uh, in Washington. And however far say, the United States escalated by introducing new, um, more powerful, more advanced weaponry on the battlefield, Putin would have matched or tried to exceed himself, only making that conflict all the more bloody. Yeah, I think another example of uh, 
disinformation and denial is MH17. And what happens there? Why does this, what happens and why does it matter? I think that the Russian response to MH17 is very indicative uh, of how Russia information and propaganda operations work in the modern Putin era, I think, as we can call it. It's a very clear, uh, in a way, kind of perfect case of how uh, Russia uh, has come to treat um, the information sphere and how it's come to think about the question of propaganda. Uh, if early in... Uh, if in the early 2000s, in the early years of Putin's um, presidency, uh, propaganda information operations meant trying to convince the viewer, convince the world of the Russian position, of trying to make Russia uh, somehow look good, of somehow having the Russian view or the Russian position on a particular subject be the dominant one and to uh, actively um, uh, counteract Western narratives, American narratives of a particular policy question by presenting uh, a very kind of clear and uh, hopefully convincing uh, Russian counter narrative uh, of the subject um, that shifted. It didn't shift overnight, it shifted um, gradually over time, and we can see it, for example, in the way that. Uh, RT, uh, which started out as Russia Today, shifted its own uh, approach uh, to explaining um, uh, and narrating uh, the news. We saw it over the breadth of um, the Putin state's information and, and, and propaganda operations. And the evolution where it eventually led us is to um, an attempt to make the very notion uh, of truth, the very notion of being able to arrive at some um, objectively uh, correct, uh, true notion of events impossible to essentially throw up as many even laughable, absurd, farcical counter narratives uh, as possible that are themselves internally contradictory, uh, uh, confusing, so that the ultimate effect on, uh, say, the viewer is that you just throw your hands up and say, I can't make heads or tails of this. I'm hearing so many uh, different, contradictory, impossible versions of this event. I'm not even going to try uh, to get to the bottom of it. I'm not even um, going to take one position or another. As a viewer, uh, I'm just going to say uh, everybody's lying. It's all hopeless. Everyone's covered in mud equally. And I refuse uh, to even uh, have a belief or have a position, a kind of post-truth uh, uh, framework. And MH17, I think, really was uh, a case where we saw this in action in a very concentrated um, uh, way, the, the apotheosis uh, of this approach. And in the days after uh, MH17 was shot down, you saw all manner of, in retrospect, quite laughable versions uh, of this event uh, on Russian television. There was an idea in the early hours after MH17 was shot down that, in fact, it was uh, the Ukrainian or American militaries trying to shoot down uh, Putin's presidential plane, which was somewhere else over the skies of um, Western Europe. Uh, at the time, you had quite disgusting versions uh, that this was all a kind of staged setup, uh, that the plane was already full of dead bodies and shot down out of the sky as a kind of uh, provocation, uh, that it was uh, a, a Ukrainian uh, fighter jet that shot down the passenger plane, that it was no, the Ukrainian uh, military using a Buk anti-aircraft missile. Uh, in, in fact, uh, Russian state television, uh, Russian uh, authorities still haven't to this day settled on one canonical uh, official version uh, of events as surrounding MH17. You still get all manner uh, of, of contradictory um, versions of, of what happened, it's a, but it's a very purposeful uh, mess. It's a very purposeful, um, opaque stew that's impossible to make heads or tails of, the, the intent, uh, the purpose of which is so that um, the viewer, the person who's interested, say, in actually understanding what happened in MH17, starts wading through this morass of um, uh, impossible to parse facts and just gives up uh, uh, because they see the Dutch 
for example, version of events, what Dutch authorities have rather painstakingly uh, put together through their own investigation, uh, proving that the, um, the plane was brought down by an anti-aircraft missile fired uh, from rebel-held territory, um, a missile presumably provided with the aid uh, of the Russian military, that that version is just one of many versions, no less believable, no less absurd than all the other versions that have been um, purposely injected into this um, media atmosphere, and that ultimately knowing the truth is impossible. How, how does this progression take place from <coughs> early basic propaganda, with which we're all familiar, with which we're all familiar, up to this moment when this What's the origin moment where it switches over, and is it is it something that's centralized and run out of uh, an office around the corner from Putin's, or is it uh, is it freelanced? Where does it come from, and how does it happen, and why did it happen? Mm -hmm. I don't think the switch in how uh, the Russian state thinks about information and propaganda operations happened overnight. I don't think there was a turning point, uh, a before and after moment. Uh, I think it was a growing realization, a, a correct one, a wise one, that uh, putting forward the Russian version of events uh, in a convincing way, getting, say, the viewer or getting foreign uh, officials, foreign governments to believe the Russian take on uh, issue X uh, was very difficult, um, uh, if not uh, impossible. Uh, if, say, Russia today was uh, still devoted to telling the viewer uh, or convincing the viewer that um, you know, Russia's uh, position on X or Y issue was the correct one. I think that's a much harder sell uh, and much harder to pull off than essentially um, uh, what Russia Today and other um, arms of the Russian uh, media and information apparatus became, which is just um, knowing the truth about issue X is so uh, impossible, so murky, because everybody's lying, everybody's covered in mud, everybody uh, is cynical, and everyone is manipulating the truth. That's essentially much easier uh, to do than to get uh, someone to believe in the Russian position on any uh, one issue. And it fits into uh, uh, some already pre-existing uh, kind of currents and trends in um, how modern um, uh, society's uh, function. It's, it's not something that Russia invented, This uh, the questions that grow out of um, societal uh, distrust, distrust of the establishment of elites, uh, of establishment media. All of those things are, 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 uh, are, are happening not because Russia uh, willed them into being. Uh, those are big uh, kind of social and political forces at play in the United States uh, and in Europe that Russia was able uh, to harness and, 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 and uh, took note of and able to um, um, play with and manipulate for its own purposes. But those aren't social phenomena that, that Russia invented. If we wanted to watch or chart its course, we could probably, could we probably watch it happen on RT from one kind of programming and orientation to telling stories to uh, w what it ultimately becomes? A telling case of where I think uh, officials in the Kremlin and those who work on media and information operations understood that something isn't really working uh, was the 2008 war um, with Georgia, a war that Russia essentially won militarily uh, very quickly in a matter of days. Uh, Russia, of course, is a, uh, a, a far um, more powerful, um, has a far more powerful military than, than Georgia. It, it wasn't really a fair fight uh, militarily, and no surprise that Russia was able to gain the upper hand uh, purely on the battlefield in a matter of days. Um, but despite that battlefield uh, victory, a narrative emerged in Moscow uh, of Russia having lost the information war. Um, I've talked to Russian officials close to the defense ministry and in the security establishment who talk about essentially bragging about what a cakewalk it was uh, militarily, and that, of course, the um, the, the armed forces of relatively small uh, Georgia were no match for the behemoth of the Russian military. That surprised uh, no one. But these officials were really dismayed at how the Georgian narrative of that war uh, became uh, the dominant one, the one accepted on international airwaves uh, in Western capitals, um, and that the military victory 
uh, for Russia was a kind of uh, shallow or at least incomplete one uh, because they had so wholly lost the information war um, in terms of understanding the why and the how uh, of that uh, of that conflict, who was the aggressor, who was the victim, who started it, and so on. On all of those questions, uh, Russia felt, um, Russian officials, uh, including some who I've spoken to, felt very aggrieved um, at how uh, badly uh, Russia uh, lost that part of the conflict. And I think it was after Georgia that there was a lot of soul-searching uh, to the extent that uh, Kremlin officials engage uh, in that sort of uh, thing about um, how did that happen? Why did that happen? Lessons learned. How was Georgia, this country we defeated on the battlefield in a matter of days, able to defeat us uh, in the information um, sphere? And I think after the Georgia wars, when you saw um, Russia getting uh, a lot savvier in terms of how um, the modern information game works. If before Georgia, um, Russian information operations had a kind of Soviet uh, tinge to them, uh, a kind of you know propaganda 1.0 approach of trying to convince the other side uh, that your position is right and the other one is wrong and that's it. That didn't work uh, in Georgia. That failed miserably, again, as Russian officials themselves would admit after Georgia. And after Georgia, I think you saw um, uh, an attempt to do a kind of lessons learned and to update um, how Russia thinks about the information question um, in terms of geopolitics. And, and the answer they came up with is chaos, disruption, lies, obfuscation. O over time, I think they came to see that it's much more effective to just introduce a whole lot of noise into the information space uh, to muddy the waters. And that ultimately is both uh, more effective and services Russia's interests more than uh, Russia uh, in a uh, kind of Khrushchevian way, banging its shoe on the table, trying to get its position uh, across and have uh, the viewer or the foreign government believe Russia's version of events much easier, much more effective just uh, to make the very notion of truth uh, seem impossible. So let's, so, so let's, I mean, I think we really can say, uh, given hindsight, that Ukraine, Crimea, were the field test of the information uh, war strategies, and uh, and even uh, cyber. So we uh, and and even in the in the fall, the Dukes cracked the State Department and the Defense Department and even the White House. Uh, we haven't really talked about the cyber uh, side of hybrid war, but it's obviously they're moving, testing, probing even in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's, uh, as Russia built up its cyber capacity, um, in a sense, that's to be expected uh, for uh, Putin, for uh, officials in the security and military establishment around him. These are um, men, and again, they're essentially all men uh, who come from a generation of the last um, cold warriors. These are uh, people who came of age um, when the Soviet Union was engaged in this superpower uh, struggle uh, with the United States, um, that struggle for them never really uh, went away. It may have taken different forms and gone through different phases, but the main central strategic adversary of Russia remains uh, the United States. Even in periods when there uh, might have been relatively uh, friendly or even congenial relations uh, between the countries. That doesn't mean uh, the United States stopped in this kind of inevitable, almost eternal way, being Russia's largest uh, and central strategic adversary. So, of course, as Russia developed these new uh, capabilities, who would they be directed against? Of course, first and foremost, the United States. So let's go to the 2000 and... Uh... Can I add one yeah, thing yeah. on that? Yeah. You know, returning, I, I, returning to this idea that as far as um, Putin and other Kremlin officials see it, whatever they might do, the United States has done before and probably uh, even better, uh, though they might not like to admit it. Uh, I've also heard from people in the uh, defense and security establishment here in Moscow that the very successful use of the Stuxnet virus by uh, 
um, uh, American and Israeli intelligence services was yet another uh, wake-up call uh, for Russia, uh, that Russia felt really um, flat-footed when it came to cyber, when it realized um, the efficacy and power that a cyber weapon uh, can have um, uh, in a geopolitical question, one as kind of weighty and consequential as um, the Iranian nuclear program, uh, a question on which Russia was very much involved and very much a player on the diplomatic uh, negotiation process, seeing how um, uh, something uh, as, as simple, uh, uh, though of course it's not simple at all, um, as uh, a cyber tool, a cyber weapon, could completely uh, disrupt um, uh, that process, could uh, have such a powerful effect, um, I think, was something that Russian officials hadn't quite understood uh, or at least internalized uh, before and, and watching uh, Stuxnet and the effect it had uh, was yet another um, uh, point at which uh, Russian officials realized we have to get in the game too. Okay, so armed with all of that motivation, uh, capacity, an understanding of the methodology of fake news and, 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 and having had probes, early probes at State and White House, DNC, RNC. Take me from Moscow's perspective, Putin's perspective, to the 2016 uh, presidential election. Um, uh, take me there. Uh, sorry, I don't quite understand. What did they, like, where, what, so now they. Where, where, where in the timeline do you want me to pick up? Um, uh, fall of uh, 15. Mm -hmm. Uh, cozy fancy, mm -hmm. uh, wh wherever wherever it feels like the right uh, way to enter, uh, telling the story from these people's, these people, mm -hmm. their perspective. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, Putin saw the 2016 presidential elections well ahead of time, let's say a year in advance, sometime in um, 2015, as uh, of, of great import to Russia and to himself personally in ways that maybe um, uh, Washington didn't quite understand at the time to how much Putin felt personally invested in the outcome um, of these elections. Putin saw in Clinton someone, again, in his understanding of the world and the way it works, uh, a person who personally uh, had tried to undermine uh, his power um, in 2011 and 2012. Uh, someone he saw as um, essentially a, a Russia hawk, a foreign policy hawk, someone who uh, in Libya was in favor uh, of regime change and, and uh, as Putin, um, in Putin's worldview, might well um, want to do the same thing uh, to him one day. And I think he had a visceral, almost existential fear uh, of a Clinton presidency in a way that wasn't um, fully appreciated uh, at the time, how, how personal um, this was uh, to him, how much he felt like Russia might be next uh, in the crosshairs if um, Hillary Clinton were to become uh, U.S. president. Um, and uh, at the same time, he saw uh, in the appearance of Trump on the scene a person who was a kind of uh, bull in a china shop. Uh, and that was uh, attractive to Putin, not even because of who uh, say Donald Trump was, uh, as an individual, what Trump might be able to offer him personally, whatever kind of relationships um, Russian uh, businessmen, say, might have with Trump. All of that um, we know uh, relatively less about and, and remains an open question, but I think it's enough to say the fact that Trump was this incredibly uh, disruptive uh, force in American politics was in and of itself enough to make him a, a very appealing um, character uh, to Putin, someone who uh, on his own was uh, shaking the foundations of the American um, political system, uh, sowing doubt, um, weakening um, uh, public faith uh, in uh, the institutions of American uh, democracy, causing a re-examination um, of those institutions, calling into doubt a lot of assumptions um, that uh, the American public and American politicians had about the functioning uh, of that system. The fact that Trump was doing all of those things on his own couldn't help but make him uh, a very attractive uh, candidate to Putin, uh, whose uh, 
uh, strategic goal long before Trump ever arrived on the scene and surely long after Trump uh, departs the scene. His strategic goal is uh, to essentially weaken uh, the United States, to weaken its institutions uh, so as uh, to give himself and to give Russia uh, a freer hand, to improve Russia's position in what Putin sees as the great strategic standoff that kind of defines uh, Russia's uh, geopolitical birthright. It's a uh, superpower standoff uh, with the United States. And if Trump is able to uh, distract, weaken, sow confusion, doubt, um, and uh, introduce turbulence in the American um, political system in a way that um, uh, distracts, weakens, undermines Americans, um, America's authority on the world stage, what's not to like uh, as Putin sees it? And the means and methods that uh, Russia presumably employed to execute that vision? What we seem to know the most about um, is uh, the hacking of uh, the DNC uh, and John Podesta's email accounts by um, cyber forces linked to the Russian uh, in intelligence services. And the fact that they were able to get into those email accounts in and of itself isn't shocking um, or all that newsworthy if it ended there, considering what we know about uh, Russia's attempts to infiltrate all manner uh, of American government institutions over the years, long before the 2016 uh, elections, the White House, State Department, other branches uh, of U.S. government. R Russian hackers, hackers working for uh, the Russian government, uh, were all over uh, those institutions uh, for years. So the fact that they might want to gain access to something like uh, the DNC uh, servers or, or the uh, email uh, of Clinton's campaign chair isn't a shock given what we know about um, their um, targeting uh, of American institutions uh, with cyber attacks before that. The key moment is, of course, the decision, which we don't know the ultimate details of, uh, to make the contents uh, of those emails uh, public. And that's where what was a classic intelligence or espionage operation, gathering information about uh, a foreign uh, adversary, something all countries do, uh, became um, a covert operation, what uh, in Russian intelligence circles is called uh, an active measure, an attempt to actually influence um, the outcome uh, of a uh, political event uh, in a foreign country. And that's where we enter into relatively uh, unprecedented territory as concerns um, the uh, post-Cold War relations between the United States and Russia. The, the of course, what, what's happening in the states right now is everybody's, especially because of the Don Trump Jr. stuff, everybody's looking very closely at, before we get to obstruction of justice, at collusion, what actually was happening, meeting the meeting with the banker, uh, the meeting with Donald Trump, meeting mm -hmm. with the woman who supposedly had dirt on Hillary Clinton. Without knowing the details, of course, of exactly what happened in the run-up to the presidential election and, and who uh, Russian officials or Russian agents might have had contact with, was there contact at all? There are some things we can uh, say and, and know for sure more broadly about uh, the Putin system and the way it tends uh, to operate. One of them uh, is that uh, the Putin system as a kind of organism uh, doesn't believe uh, in institutions, um, it believes in individuals. And, and, and what that means is that uh, personal relationships uh, are key uh, to, to Putin and to the way that the Putin system operates. It doesn't, um, certainly domestically and even internationally, put much faith in processes, in institutions, in kind of systems that work uh, bigger than or beyond the personal will and personal interest of particular uh, individuals. It doesn't trust or understand those kinds of models uh, of uh, political relations, again, inside Russia domestically or on the world stage. What the Putin system does understand are the very personal motivations and interests uh, of particular people uh, and, and trying very much to rely uh, uh, on personal uh, relationships. Everything can be decided uh, between uh, two people. That's why um, put simply, you know, Putin uh, doesn't like, uh, one of the reasons why Putin doesn't like the European Union, 
there's no one really to reach uh, an agreement with there. The European Union is the kind of epitome of a sprawling, faceless bureaucratic structure. Who is your counterparty there? Who is the person you can sit down and have a heart-to-heart -heart, uh, uh, conversation with and, and come up uh, with some sort of agreement? Nobody. And that makes Putin very uncomfortable. Where Putin's comfortable is where there's one individual whom uh, he can uh, study, uh, understand the uh, psychology of, the motivations of, and reach a deal with. And, and who uh, is more of a self-professed deal maker than uh, Trump uh, and those around him? And I think in that, Putin um, and Trump uh, are very similar. Uh, both of them are art of the deal uh, type figures uh, for whom um, uh, sitting in a room uh, with your counterparty, understanding who they are, what they want, um, the levers by which you can uh, influence them and, and what you can provide to them in terms of motivation, uh, that's how uh, things get done. And I think we can uh, say with certainty that that's the, the modus operandi um, for, uh, for the Putin system. If the President of the United States walks up to the President of Russia and essentially says, come over here and says, knock it off, What's the likelihood of that being the uh, definitive measure that will stop him from uh, uh, continuing? I, I think that a request uh, from uh, the President of the United States to stop getting up to bad behavior uh, is far from sufficient to actually uh, stop that behavior if Putin sees it in Russia's um, strategic uh, interest. If, if Putin sees it as something of great, potentially existential importance, uh, He's going to keep doing it, uh, just as he kept doing it, say, uh, in, uh, in in Ukraine throughout that um, crisis in, in in Crimea and in the war uh, in the East. How many moments were there when Western governments, the Obama White House, above all, above all, told Putin, "Stop that! Uh, don't annex Crimea! Don't uh, uh, provide um, weapons and other support to the." Um, rebels in the East. Don't intervene directly militarily with your own forces in eastern Ukraine. How many times was um, Putin told no or don't do that? And in all of those cases, uh, he went ahead and did it anyway because, again, for him, doing so was of higher um, uh, strategic importance uh, in his understanding of Russian interests than whatever um, conflict or worsening in relations with the United States would result from him not doing that. And I think in that sense, we can talk about Putin as being essentially a, a rational actor, a rational actor in according to the framework and hierarchy of interest as he sees it. If it's more important uh, for his interests, for Russia's interests as Putin defines them, to keep doing some uh, bad behavior that the United States is warning him off of doing, uh, uh, whatever... Uh, he achieves from that is worth more to him than risking uh, a worsening of relations with the United States, which by the end of 2014 were you know, pretty much in the dumpster anyway. So speaking of bad behavior, bots, trolls, fake news, it's unleashed in the summer. Explain. Mm, I think a few things came together in Russia attempting and understanding how to use uh, the information space uh, to further its objectives. One, we've talked about the shifting understanding of what effective propaganda is, going from being something where you're trying to convince the other side of your position to just trying to throw as much um, uh, uh, as much mud uh, uh, in, into the water as possible so as to make it uh, opaque. Um, uh, also, uh, we've, as we've also talked about this belief, very genuine, firmly held belief uh, in the Kremlin that um, the revolutions across uh, the post-Soviet world uh, in the uh, 2000s, the Arab Spring revolutions, that all of those political upheavals were caused in part by America's manipulation uh, of the information space, uh, of local uh, media resources, um, of, of stirring up uh, civic and political passions through the manipulation of information. With that uh, belief and with the new understanding and how kind of postmodern propaganda uh, works, Russia um, decided to, to, to marshal those resources and apply them uh, in the U.S. Um, political uh, 
uh, context. The understanding was there, the tools were there, the capacity was there, the motivation was there in terms of why Russia would want to intervene in that way. And so when you uh, take all of those factors together, it then becomes why wouldn't they, uh, why wouldn't they do it uh, if all of those other pre-existing conditions are met? What is that business? What, how important is it? Is it coming out of the military here? Is it coming out of the intelligence agencies here? Is it uh, subcontractors who are, who are in the pri private, uh, private world? Mm -hmm. When we talk about the people who are actually involved in these kinds of operations, the, the ground level, whether it's hackers, trolls, um, other people involved uh, as the kind of foot soldiers in the Kremlin's information war, uh, we don't really know exactly uh, who they are because that world remains uh, very opaque. Uh, we know, for example, that there is uh, something like a cyber command inside the Russian Ministry of Defense, but we actually don't know who its commander is. We don't know its size uh, or structure. Uh, and so in that sense, there's less understanding of uh, how Russia conducts these operations than, say, the United States. Again, not that we know the detailed inner workings of how um, uh, American cyber forces works, but we at least have a kind of organizational or hierarchical, um, uh, we can make some organizational hierarchical guesses about how those forces are structured. Here in Russia, it's much more uh, difficult. Uh, there seem to be overlapping uh, cyber forces inside the Ministry uh, of Defense. Uh, one can presume that their interests and targets are of a more uh, military nature, penetrating and perhaps um, manipulating or weakening um, uh, the kind of military command and control structures of adversarial uh, countries. You, know, you have cyber forces inside um, uh, various intelligence structures, inside the FSB, the main uh, security service, a successor uh, to the KGB, though you also have different cyber structures inside the GRU, the military uh, intelligence unit. And you also have a patchwork of uh, what you might call public-private partnership um, uh, hackers, um, uh, cybersecurity uh, companies and labs, research centers um, working on um, uh, state orders, uh, on state commissions. These are laboratories close to the security services but technically independent. You also have a very interesting phenomenon that's been documented uh, here in the Russian press of former criminal hackers, people who were, say, sitting in their um, bedroom stealing credit card numbers online, uh, being uh, pulled in by the FSB and offered a kind of deal. Instead of going to jail, how about you come uh, work for us? And that's uh, a very interesting aspect. Uh, 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 that's one narrow window uh, that we've gleaned into how um, these forces are put together, that um, not only is there some evidence that um, the Russian military and security services recruit among the graduates of the country's more uh, most prestigious um, uh, and advanced technology um, institutes and computer science programs, but also uh, reach into the world of the criminal underground uh, pulling out uh, hackers who have run afoul of the law and are um, given the choice of uh, avoiding jail time and going to work for the state. So when Trump wins, what's the reaction here? I think in the early moments of Trump's victory, there was surprise and confusion just like there was uh, in America. Uh, I think in the ultimate run-up to the vote, say, in the final weeks uh, before Election Day, uh, officials in the Kremlin were operating under a very similar set of assumptions uh, as were um, those following uh, the election in Washington and, and throughout the United States. Um, you know, the Kremlin doesn't have uh, uh, any better polling or research data than um, you know, the New York Times or 538 or any number of resources who are tracking in great and exacting detail uh, the you know day by day uh, shifting um, calibrations in, in in polling data before uh, the election. The, the, the Kremlin didn't know any more about uh, the way the election might, uh, the actual voting might go, than did anyone else following the um, uh, polling numbers quite closely in the days before the vote. And what that means is the Kremlin was essentially bracing itself uh, for uh, a Hillary Clinton victory. And it, it's very 
instructive, I think, to watch uh, Russian state television, not because you'll find out something all that uh, revelatory or necessarily even true, but it's a very good um, prism into understanding uh, the mood of the day uh, in official circles in Moscow, and it's a good translator of the official mood from the Kremlin onto state airwaves. And if you go back and watch coverage of the election in the last, say, two weeks before the vote, uh, the tone of that coverage was really striking. It was about uh, discrediting the American political system uh, as a whole. It wasn't so much about prevent presenting Donald Trump as this kind of great white hope, as this incredible, virtuous, preferred candidate. It was uh, preparing the viewer to believe that the American political system uh, was rigged, that of course the American political establishment would never allow Trump uh, to win, paving the way for a, a Clinton victory, a, a victory that the Kremlin was prepared to greet with clenched teeth, uh, but nonetheless um, anticipating that Clinton would win uh, and that the message would be uh, the American political system is somehow uh, fixed, broken, not to be trusted, even uh, as one of Russia's more bombastic hosts on state airwaves was suggesting that there would be impeachment hearings uh, from day one. So there was this focus um, uh, not so much on, on, preventing, on presenting Trump as the imminent victor, but between the lines, um, making do with the fact that Clinton was likely to win. But nonetheless, how can we um, cast doubt uh, on that uh, victory and, and weaken what um, many in Moscow expected to be uh, her presidency. And Putin's reaction to Trump's victory? Uh, we'll never really know how, how Putin responded in the first minutes and hours after Trump's victory. Uh, there was famously a moment in the Russian Duma uh, parliament here uh, where when the news was announced to parliamentarians, they stood up uh, in an extended um, uh, standing ovation, applauding uh, for several minutes. One of those parliamentarians later had uh, a party in his office where they uh, popped champagne and toasted Trump's victory. So clearly there was a lot of excitement uh, in Moscow. But I think that that sort of thing uh, is more uh, for show, a more kind of emotional uh, outburst among uh, not necessarily the ultimate decision-making uh, class in Moscow. And I think Putin uh, is a savvier, smarter, and, and ultimately much more suspicious uh, figure who I don't think excites uh, too easily. I think he understood that uh, Trump's victory uh, presented certainly Russia with a range of unexpected and perhaps welcome uh, opportunity and, and, and room for maneuver. And um, uh, it was certainly more a pleasant surprise than an unpleasant surprise. But I think uh, Putin was never under any illusions about uh, Trump's um, unpredictability, his, his brashness, his uncontrollability. Uh, such an uh, unpolished, uh, unprofessional figure is both what made him uh, attractive as a kind of wrecking ball inside the American political system. But once Putin realized he would actually be U.S. president, I think that also must have given him some pause. Let me ask these guys what we've missed before we run out of time. Um, Mike, what do you have? What was, in the wake of the election, what has Putin learned? Is, is this a strategy that he would continue, or uh, was, is this something he wouldn't do again? What's his, what's his approach now? I think it's too early to say, does Putin consider this operation ultimately uh, a success or not? Certainly successful in the sense that if one of the strategic objectives was to weaken, disrupt, undermine the American political system, on that score, I think you can say mission accomplished. No matter what ultimately uh, comes of uh, the Trump presidency, the degree of um, chaos and distraction uh, that has been introduced into politics in Washington certainly fits with the objective uh, to um, cast doubt uh, on the durability uh, and stability uh, of the American uh, political system. And, and uh, the American political establishment is certainly distracted 
and inward looking uh, in a way it hasn't been uh, in some time, which does give Putin a great degree of um, flexibility and, and room to maneuver uh, in areas of his geopolitical uh, interest uh, around the world. Uh, the degree to which there will be blowback uh, from that operation bring to light uncomfortable, unsavory things about um, how uh, the Kremlin uh, does business, that remains uh, to be seen. And it's possible that as investigations, journalistic, Congress, uh, special prosecutor and others move forward, uh, the world will begin to learn things about how um, Russia conducts its operations that will be very unwelcome for Putin, who is accustomed and likes to do things without much scrutiny or oversight. That's certainly what he has become used to here in Russia, not having the nitty gritty of his operations uh, laid bare for the world to see. I'm well, not right. really sure you can put this genie back in the bottle, and that's just a function of the way the world works today. Uh, RT will exist and find an audience, if not uh, through the airwaves, then online. Um, the internet, obviously, uh, one would hope will never be uh, controlled or constrained uh, for American users. So Russia will always have a way, and not just Russia, all manners of foreign states and actors will always have a way of reaching uh, foreign audiences, including uh, American ones, going forward. No one can uh, turn that switch off, it seems. David? Just a, just a quick question. Guys. I'm still puzzled by the tension between the idea that Putin is a you know, strongman centralizer, he's, he's eliminated competition uh, in politics, he's got so much control. And yet we get this other picture that it's something as important as influencing the American election, he relies on freelancers and oligarchs, and, and there's this loose uh, coalition of royal court that tries to impress him. Lawyers from the Moscow Oblast do things. I mean, can both these things be true, and have, or is, which of them is true? Uh, I think both uh, are true at the same time. Putin is um, a, an authoritarian leader with a great deal of singular uh, control over his political system, a political system that has become very personalized over his now 17 years and counting in power that relies uh, on his authority uh, and in many cases breaks down or ceases to function uh, when his authority um, isn't uh, present in a decisive way. But at the same time, uh, the system can be uh, incredibly um, weak, inefficient, uh, chaotic, uh, to say that it's uh, controlled and administered by Putin's singular authority is not the same thing to say it's a kind of well-oiled machine. It oftentimes uh, is not. It oftentimes is a very um, flimsy-seeming uh, construction that's barely uh, held together and operates more by the logic of chaos and improvisation than anything um, uh, grandly uh, strategic. Uh, if you talk to a lot of uh, Russian journalists in the know, respected people who've covered Putin and the Kremlin for years, they laugh at this notion of Putin as being presented as a kind of great uh, chess master, thinking many moves uh, ahead. To them, that seems a kind of farcical notion. Putin uh, is very quick on his feet. He's best uh, when he uh, uh, has to make a decision uh, in a kind of improvisational, uh, tactical uh, way, and he's very good at making uh, the best of opportunities presented to him oftentimes by other people's uh, weakness or the disorder or dysfunction on the side of his adversary. He's good at uh, maximizing that moment to ultimately punch far above uh, his and Russia's uh, geopolitical uh, weight. He has the advantage of not having uh, to uh, consult with Parliament, of not having to take into account uh, public uh, opinion, of not having uh, to uh, make sure he's um, kind of operating in concert with uh, business and corporate uh, interests. He can, uh, he can move when he wants in a very decisive uh, and singular way, but that's not the same thing as saying he has a kind of master uh, vision that he uh, pursues um, with great kind of uh, consistency uh, and, and persistence and efficacy uh, over time. Uh, if you talk to Russian journalists who covered Putin and the Putin system for years, they say um, behind the scenes, it's all a bit of a mess. It's all a bit of a chaotic, improvised uh, game 
that Putin often uh, plays well, but that doesn't mean uh, he's this uh, great strategic visionary. Is the perception that Putin is the puppet master of all of this uh, in some ways a fiction we've created growing out of the Cold War and our perception of Russia uh, or the Soviet Union then as the great enemy? I mean, if they're reacting to us, we're also reacting to them. And certainly the press uh, may suffer mm -hmm. from this 10-foot-tall uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, puppet master mm -hmm. named uh, Vladimir Putin. I know from talking to people who circulate uh, on the outer rings uh, of, of power uh, in the Kremlin that Putin uh, and those close to him are ultimately pleased uh, at how they're being presented uh, in the American narrative. They very much like this image of themselves, um, of Putin personally, as this kind of puppet master pulling the strings of something as mighty uh, as the American uh, political system. In a way, that's the ultimate prize, the ultimate compliment. Um, I think that's uh, essentially false uh, and, and overplays um, uh, Putin's role and, and gives Putin too much credit. Um, uh, whatever the Russian uh, government did to try and influence the outcome uh, of the U.S. presidential uh, election, it doesn't make the outcome of that election uh, Putin's singular doing. It doesn't make um, Trump... Uh, hold on. Um, that do, it doesn't make Trump a president installed uh, by Putin. Trump was a president ultimately elected by uh, American uh, voters. And in understanding um, the role uh, of Putin personally and uh, uh, the Russian state more broadly uh, in the 2016 presidential election, it's important uh, to remember that, that this is ultimately an American story uh, not a Russian one, and by making it all about uh, Putin and his kind of seeming uh, omnipotence and brilliance in being able to manipulate everyone from the president of the United States to voters uh, in swing states gives him far uh, too much power. It's ultimately analytically uh, incorrect and perhaps in a sense strategically kind of unwise because it, it gives him uh, exactly what he has been craving uh, all these years, a kind of um, power balance uh, with the United States. It, it makes him uh, not just a, a, a superpower on par with the U.S., but almost uh, above it uh, and, and dominant over it, uh, something that he could have only uh, dreamed of uh, all these years and has now uh, been given uh, by many parts of uh, the media, uh, American political system, and so on. Fabulous. Thank here, you. Here.